Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for being here. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the university that currently leads the ballot bowl in California for registering the most students to vote, that's your Cal State Fullerton. Welcome to Cal State Fullerton's Civil Dialogue event hosted today by our Office of Government and Community Relations and Dr. Tara Suinya Tachaiford. To use one of our five predetermined stances of our panelists today that you're gonna get very used to, I strongly agree that this is an outstanding program and that it further establishes Cal State Fullerton as both a hub of high impact practices for our students and a steward of place for our community, which is really important. For those of you who are attending for the first time, Civil Dialogues is a forum to have a potentially difficult but necessary conversation about controversial issues. Now more than ever in our increasing polarized climate where disagreements can often escalate into demonizing the other side or shouting down of opposing voices or even violence, Cal State Fullerton is intentional in creating a space to facilitate an open, honest and respectful dialogue with members of our community. To be clear, this program transcends the importance of our First Amendment mandated content neutral policies and practices regarding speech and expression. It upholds that important tenant for sure, but it also enhances our mission to foster a learning environment in which different voices from all sides of the political aisles are present, respected, and central to our efforts to prepare students to thrive in a diverse global economy. And for me personally, as a lawyer and a defender of the First Amendment, I'm especially dedicated to programs like this that uphold our free speech and expression rights on our campus in a safe and respectful space. And as founders of Civil Dialogue describe it, this is a place for participants to explore hot topics with cool heads. I love that, hot topics with cool heads. To realize that we can disagree with each other on the issues, but still recognize and respect each other's humanity. Given the timing, I couldn't think of a better way to explore hot topics with cool heads than by discussing the upcoming election, specifically the electoral process and challenges to misconceptions facing voter integrity. As an, uh, important as today is, there is one huge takeaway from today's program, one huge takeaway that I want you to take away from today's program. I hope it is the idea that our democracy can only survive if we exercise our right and responsibility to vote. Now, I would never presume, never presume to tell you how to vote, but I will use the power of my Zoom pulpit here to boldly entreat you with full heart to register, inform yourself and vote. If you are wondering why I'm so empathetic on this point, consider the following, what I think of as a travesty. In 2016, less than 15% of eligible college students in our nation voted. Now that is an abysmal number. And it became the impetus for Cal State Fullerton to begin a year round voter registration program to motivate our students to become not only voters, but informed voters to not only vote, but encourage friends and family to follow suit, to not only widen the path to the polls for all Titans, but to obliterate the systemic obstruction of voting rights for historically marginalized, marginalized communities. That is in large part uh, the effort that we had in the fall of 2018 when we registered more than 2,600 new voters in the months leading up to that election. A feat that made us back then number one in the CSU in terms of the number of students registered. And we improved our voter turnout rate by 200% from 2014. And why we are currently on top of the ballot bowl again, a recent self-assessment tells us that there are still too many among us who would not take the time to register and still others who had the right to vote, but inexplicably, they don't plan to exercise that either be that because they feel that California's already decided on the presidential election or because they don't fully understand the power and the importance of local government and the need for their voice in there in that area too. Worse yet, they feel disenfranchised or disaffected to the point of disinterest. Well, it's events like this, motivating, exciting, empowering these folks to realize that the value of their voice and the responsibility that they have 
to vote begins today. It begins right now with this event, programs that spur conversation and engage voters from all walks of life. We don't intend for everyone to agree on everything or this would be really boring. Instead, we hope that by facilitating a civil dialogue, we can, we will demonstrate how to disagree, not as enemies, but as members of the Titan community who recognize and respect the importance of diverse voices at the table, civil dialogue on our campus and inform vo vo uh, voters at the polls. But before we get to it, I wanna thank every Titan who's here to engage and participate, especially our students. Your presence tells me that you believe, you believe not only in the power of free speech and, free and civil dialogue, but also the right and responsibility to be informed when you vote. And I want to thank Dr. Tara and her team in our Office of Government and Community Relations, our moderator and the Titan debate coach, Lee Thatch, and, uh, and all our amazing panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you for participating and, anticip and in anticipation of what you will be doing on election day. Thank you for voting. Now let's get to it. Wow, I feel like that deserves an applause. <laughs> at uh, our regular event, we'll all be clapping by now. But um, thank you so much, President Virgie, for that very enthusiastic as well as warm welcome and introduction. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm excited that you're here and welcome to our first virtual civil dialogue. My name is Dr. Tara and I'm an assistant professor of human communication studies and a civil dialogue organizer. Today's event is of course co-hosted by the Office of Government and Community Relations. So what are we all doing here today? Let me explain a little bit about today's event. Civil dialogue is a structured public dialogue that facilitates and bridges differing viewpoints. It is not a debate. It is not a panel of experts giving a speech, but just a conversation among members of our community. In a civil dialogue session, Volunteer panelists take their positions ranging from agree strongly to disagree strongly and offer their opinion on a controversial statement. Today's statement is, the American voting system cannot be trusted. What do you think? The dialogue between our panelists will be about 20 minutes. Audience Q&A will be about 15 minutes. The dialogue is then extended to you, the audience who are encouraged to respond with your own comments and questions. Since we're on Zoom today, please do so by using the Q&A tab. You'll be able to type in questions and comments throughout the event. Please just click the Q&A tab. I will read the selected questions from Q&A out loud and designate a panelist to respond. If you would like to direct your question to a certain panelist, Feel free to specify that in your question text. Now, let me review the main rules of civil dialogue. The main rules are, participants should use truthful speech that does not attack others. Any piece of fact that is not known by the majority will be checked by our fact checker. Because at Cal State Fullerton, we care about facts. Uh, today's fact checker is Heidi Hong, who is a CSUF alum. I hope she's uh, waving. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi, for your service to our community. Um, participants should listen respectfully while others speak. And of course, sharing your opinion is welcome, but hateful comments towards other participants will not be tolerated. We hope to create a safe space to discuss various viewpoints on this topic with the hopes of building a healthy civic community on our diverse campus. Let's meet our panelists. Sitting in strongly agree, Carlos Paleos, human communication studies graduate student. Somewhat agree, Ezra Bakar, higher education graduate student. Undecided neutral, Christina Revel, human communication studies graduate student. Somewhat disagree, Eric Palmer, political science undergraduate student, and strongly disagree, Dr. Scott Spitzer, 
Professor of Political Science. Today's dialogue will be co-facilitated with uh, by Lee Thatch. Lee is the assistant debate coach to our award-winning Cal State Fullerton forensics team. Oh, that was a mouthful. <laughs> now that you're familiar with uh, how civil dialogue works, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I will be reviewing past and present election controversies, including an outline of general controversies and then an overview of the 2020 presidential election. The general controversies of US elections include money in politics, election rigging by the political parties, and distrust of voters themselves. Regarding money in politics, the Supreme Court ruled in Citizens United that campaign contributions are protected by the First Amendment. This has led to increasing campaign spending by corporate and special interests, which according to a 2014 Princeton study leads to government policies that mainly benefit the wealthy class. In a 2018 Pew Research poll, 77% of Americans believe that there should be limits on money spent on campaign contributions. Regarding election rigging, ongoing controversies include gerrymandering, where political parties redraw district lines to ensure that one party will always win that district. Political parties also have been accused of voter disenfranchisement. Due to concerns for voter fraud, state Republican parties have instituted voter ID laws, which the Democratic Party has accused voter ID laws of preventing low-income voters from voting. Lastly, there is distrust among voters themselves. The advent of fake news has led to concerns that voters will vote based on false information. Even without fake news, U.S. citizens already rank low in civic education. Only about one third of Americans can name all three branches of government, which according to your election fact sheet is the executive, legislative and judicial branch. And only about half of eligible voters actually vote. However, any problems of the 2020 elections are just the tip of the iceberg, as we now face a compounding set of controversies, fear of foreign interference, potential fraudulent mail-in ballots and distrust in whether both political parties will accept the results of the election. President Trump has accused mail-in ballots of leading to voter fraud, and has since blocked funds from the US Postal Service and slowed down mail services. The Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, has documented 1,000 cases of voter fraud, although the FBI claims it has no evidence of any coordinated voter fraud schemes. A recent Gallup poll shows that 53% of Americans consider voter fraud to be a major problem. Voter fraud aside, mail-in ballots are more susceptible to mistakes, leading to an increase in rejected ballots. So far, more than 550,000 absentee ballots have been rejected during the primary election. The delay in vote counts due to mail-in ballots during the COVID-19 pandemic could lead to two results, with Republicans winning votes for in-person voting on election day and Democrats winning with mail-in ballots later. This may lead to a constitutional crisis in which neither party claims victory by January 20th, Inauguration Day. Hence why this coming election is expected to be the most litigated election since the 2000 election. So where do you stand on the statement, the American voting system cannot be trusted? Strongly agree, somewhat agree, neutral, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree? All right, thank you so much, Lee, for the introduction to the topic. Now that we're all familiar with the topic and what we're discussing today, I'd like to get started uh, with our panelists. Are we ready? Okay, so our panelists will start with a one minute each introduction speech to why they're in that position. Um, Carlos, for agree strongly, would you like to start? Of course. Wonderful. <laughs> So my name is Carlos Palayo, and I'm a communication studies major here at Cal State Fullerton. So I'm standing on the side of strongly agree for the main reason that the exigency of the entire summer of Black Lives Matter protests has really just convinced us of one conclusion. And it's that voting in the traditional sense has always failed to and will continue to fail to account for its own history of white supremacy. On white supremacy, U.S. President Donald Trump actually understood this best when he spoke at a rally in Minnesota just this last month, saying that he failed to condemn white supremacists and blamed low-income people of color for ruining this American dream. And I think that this is higher and greater indicative of a larger problem, which is the fact that 
The system is not broken. Rather, it's always been intention to function exactly as it is right now, which is not really supporting the people who need to be represented the most, i.e. your marginalized people. But it's very much, as George Jackson once said, an electoral choice of 10 different fascists. It's just like choosing which way one wants to die. And today we're not itching to die, but rather the argument here is that we cannot disentangle a history of white supremacy from itself. We have to do better. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, next is Agree Somewhat Ezra. Hi everyone, my name is Ezra Bakar and I am a graduate student studying higher education at CSUF. I chose the position of Agree Somewhat because I believe that Sure, the American voting system can be trusted, but that trust is only held for certain people, and those certain people are people with privilege. People with privilege continually see that the voting system will always appear to result in their favor, whereas people without privilege who have barriers and gerrymandering thrusted upon them by these people of privilege will consistently see the results and the hardships and their vo votes um, usually don't get counted too much in these presidential elections because of voter fraud um, and other types of um, institutional barriers that they see. Thank you, Ezra. Uh, next, we have undecided neutral, Christina. Hello all, my name is Christina Rietfeld and I'm a graduate student also in the Human Communication Studies Department. And as Dr. Tara said, I will be representing the undecided neutral perspective. To give you some background on why my perspective is even here is I'm here to provide a balanced perspective or to represent the concerns of undecided voters basically to somewhat represent all of you, to question the other panelists here as to exactly why they hold the beliefs and the positions that they have selected. I think it's important to consider both the pros and the cons of the current system. It's important to trust the system somewhat because what is the alternative? Absolute voter apathy, which was discussed earlier by Lee. It's an issue, absolutely, but especially this year when the stakes of the election could not be higher, it's important to not go so far as to discourage people from voting. On the other hand, in a democratic system, it's important to critique the nature of our system so that it can truly represent all of us. After all, what is the alternative? And can we find it? Thank you, Christina. Uh, up next, we have Eric for Disagree Somewhat. My name is Eric Palmer. I'm an undergraduate student of political science, and I disagree somewhat with that statement because I feel that uh, voter fraud is very uh, a minor occurrence in the United States. If the Heritage Foundation found a thousand cases of voter fraud out of the millions and millions of people, then that is not an occurrence that we should really be that concerned about. And uh, mail-in ballots and things like that have security measures like uh, matching signatures and tracking systems to see where your vote goes. But I think that this system can be improved. And I think the best way for that would be to changing the legislative branches of state and federal governments into uh, like a proportional representation or mixed proportional representation where they would have the chance to get small minor parties a voice in uh, the legislative um, branch where they may not have in uh, the, the system today. Thank you, Eric. Up next, uh, we have Dr. Scott Spitzer for Disagree Strongly. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Tara, and everybody else for being part of this. So I disagree with this statement strongly because the idea that our voting system somehow can't be trusted is misinformed at best and heavily influenced by all the negative rhetoric from people who believe that maybe they might lose this upcoming election like President Trump who keeps saying falsely over and over again that voting by mail will lead to tremendous corruption. So let me make, I'm gonna make five big points. One, America has steadily expanded our voting rights since our founding and pretty much today almost every single adult citizen in the United States who's not in some kind of an institution can vote. That's over 200 million people who can vote. Secondly, participation nowadays is even higher than it's ever been, than it's been in a long time. In 2018, in the midterm election, um, 
voter turnout was its highest in over a hundred years. Uh, and a lot of that was driven by young people uh, increasing their involvement. That's not a sign of a voting system that is failing. That's a sign of a robust voting system. Third, as uh, my friend Eric, uh, my student Eric Palmer was saying, um, the extensive research on voter fraud finds it's infinitesimally small uh, as a proportion of all votes. Um, there are tons of these studies, including one commissioned by President Trump's own administration that finds the same thing over and over again. Fourth, uh, mail-in voting is actually more reliable than uh, in-person voting. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and fifth, the last thing is that we're already using mail-in voting and we're using it successfully. And um, there's almost zero, almost zero uh, cases of proven fraud with mail-in voting. For all of that together, and you see a voting system that is working, um, it's just the, the issue is, can we use it? Thank you, Scott. All right, now that uh, we hear from each of our participants in their introduction speech, I'd like to start the dialogue portion. Does anybody would like to start? All right, Ezra. Hi, uh, so I kind of want to open up the dialogue um, because we have covered that, yes, Americans can vote, but I want to bring up um, in an ideal world where Americans could go out and vote on November 3rd. Um, not everyone necessarily has that privilege. Some people work two jobs. Some people go to class all day and don't necessarily have time or they have kids and don't have time to get childcare for the, their kids. So what do you all recommend that they do? Um, also, um, not everyone has resources or the voter education to know that they can uh, request a mail-in ballot or an absentee ballot. So how do we make sure that those who don't have the privilege of the education or voter education know that they can do this? And typically, those people who don't have this voter education are, are minorities in uh, America. They don't necessarily have that privilege. So I, I'd like to respond to that a bit. I would question whether that is a flaw within our voting system itself or perhaps a problem with our education system as well as problems with accessibility, perhaps not a problem with the voting system itself in terms of whether or not it can be trusted. Inline, like to respond to that? Yes. Can I um, can I jump in here real quick? Uh, yes, please feel free to do so anytime. I think these are really important points about um, inequality and participation, um, and I think that uh, so I'm really glad Ezra brought that up. I'm really glad that Carlos mentioned the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and how important that is in terms of uh, you know. Uh, Making it, making it known that there's a lot of inequality in the United States. Um, uh, but I think that Christina put her finger on something really important, which is this question about, is the problem with the actual voting system or is the issue with our perception about it? And as I made my, my point at the top of my talk, I think that people are taking in a lot of negative rhetoric about voting this year and in years past, um, it doesn't, you know, in years past, it's been a lot about, oh, my vote doesn't matter. They're all the same. They're all corrupt politicians. Um, and then uh, now it's that the, you know, the voting system can't be trusted. It's corrupt because it's mail-in voting. And I think those are, those are false, uh, those are straw men, right? And I think here's the thing what I would argue, and I'll just stop after this. When people vote in large numbers, uh, politicians pay attention. Politicians pay attention. And when young people vote in large number, politicians pay attention to young people. And when racial minorities use the franchise, as difficult as it may be in some places, and I will uh, agree to that, um, but it's still available, um, and their voices will be heard much more loudly. Um, protests are really important, but votes are what really matter. 
I'm going to go ahead and jump in here as well. I think that Dr. Spitzer definitely talks about something that is super, super important, which is accessibility. But I do kind of want to open it up to the rest of the panel to hear what your opinions are as well when it comes to really tackling that root cause of not whether or not it is accessible, but whether or not people, first of all, feel safe going to the polls, especially when you have the actual president of the United States that has encouraged um, militias and others to also go guard said polls. But second, I don't think it necessarily addresses the question of representation directly enough in that protests are the language of the people. And I think that this entire summer has really shown us that there was a large amount of distrust already with the system that people just patently do not trust the system years and years and years of opening up accessibility and giving more access to people and pushing them to go to the polls and yet we still have issues like the electoral college which are still very much functioning so i don't necessarily see the system working out for us if it hasn't done anything especially for racial minorities so far summer protests really does show us that Anyone would like to respond to that or start a different issue? Um, I would also like to um, express like some concern with the electoral college. I don't necessarily believe that it is representative of our, you know, people and you know the way that we should be voting. Like we saw with the um, election, our last election, where Hillary. Clinton did receive more votes, but lost the election due to the electoral college. Um, and so I do wanna express that, Carlos, that was very well put. Um, Eric or Christina? Uh, I just, I guess, point out that uh, the electoral college for the most part works. It just happens that uh, two elections in the last 130 years, it didn't match up with the popular vote. But by and large, for the most part, it's uh, it seems to work. Let me chime in and ask a broader question. Works for who, I guess, is what I'm asking. Uh, well, uh, the people in those states that get the most votes it uh it certainly could be improved i wouldn't mind uh proportional I, i'm all about the proportional proportional uh electoral votes i think would be a great improvement but for the most part i think a majority of the americans that actually vote feel like it represents them most of the time I actually want to tack onto something you said there you said that those who actually vote so kind of going back to our earlier conversation um, and I believe Lee brought that up as well regarding voter apathy. Do you think that there is a correlation between people not voting and their belief that perhaps their vote doesn't even count anyway? Uh, for me personally, I could I could see that, especially since um, you know states like New York or Texas or California, it's it's kind of decided where your electoral votes are going to go. I'm sure, you know, one of the largest Republican uh, amounts of people are in the state of California, but every election they're going to get their vote for the Democrat. So I can see how that's an issue for sure in apathy. Um, but I also feel like if, if there was a system in place where, uh, you know, their vote mattered more in state bodies or, you know, this first past the post system is really part of the problem as well how many people really care when they only have two options maybe they don't like them and they're so a third party believer but if they don't have the play, place and time for their vote to even count then i could see how that's an issue for people to vote let me chime in for a minute on both of these issues i think these are really important issues thank you for bringing them up so um, if we just backtrack for a second historically and remember why the Electoral College was put in place, the original idea is that the public was not going to even vote for the President of the United States. So the United States, the people have really taken that away from the framers who said, oh, no, we're going to have these elite men in every state decide who the president is because the public 
doesn't have enough knowledge to, to make that decision. And I, actually the public starting in 1830s, uh, you know, started to vote and determine how their electoral college for the, each of their states should vote. Now, um, I'll, I'll uh, buy into the idea that when the electoral college does not match with the uh, popular vote, that that is a problem. On the other hand, um, is the problem be the the system they vote the uh, whether or not voting is um, trustworthy, or is the system that our electoral college uh, uh, is a uh, designed to actually make sure that every single state is heard from, including states with rural populations, um, smaller groups of people that have needs that ought to be part of our national conversation and have to be addressed um, because of the balance that the Electoral College forces. The last thing, um, uh, uh, well, I'll leave it at that and open it up for more discussion because I'd really love to hear what you guys have to say. There's definitely something I think that to tack onto that is really important just to contextualize, and it's the entire idea of representation when it comes to um, Midwestern states as well, or rural states. And I think it's just kind of a humbling statistic to hear the fact that California only has two senators, right? Diane Fencine and, or I cannot have her name right now, and Kamala Harris. But when you contextualize that within the larger scheme of things, for example, Illinois, 32 senators, that's a pretty big number especially when you consider the massive disproportionate uh, population differences between the two states. So I don't think it's so much of a matter of whether or not it's appealing to the demographic or whether or not you're giving proper representation to everyone across the board, but it's really just a matter of the system does work, but not in the way that we think it does necessarily. Carlos, surely you mean that Illinois has two senators, but if they were equivalent to California, they would have 30, 30 to that the, the deconversion, yeah, because every two senators, right? Yeah, thank you for the math. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring up one other point, and I forgot it when I was making my point about the electoral college, which is about local elections. Which is that when you guys go out and vote, and I hope everybody watching this is registered, and if you're not, please get registered. Um, uh, there's uh, all sorts of information on our government relations website, which you can access easily from our portal um, about how to register, about how to vote and all that stuff. But when we vote, we're not just voting for president of the United States. And so if you're worried that, oh, California is for sure gonna be a democratic state, um, that's occurred over many, many years. And we didn't always vote for Democrats. In fact, Bill Clinton was the first democratic president we voted for in a long time. but your vote really matters for your city council and your mayor and your state legislature and uh, your house of representatives. And in Orange County in particular, we have a number of uh, US house members who were elected by very narrow margins in the 2018 election who are up for reelection this year. So it's gonna, these, these elections could be very close. Your vote really will make a difference. We're coming up with another minute or so with the panelist dialogue. There's something that I think would be kind of appropriate to talk about. And it's something that we've sort of circumvented so far in this conversation, which is obstacles. Again, it's not really so much the issue of like accessibility, but rather it's obstacles that are seemingly baked into the system. Um, voter suppression being one of them, intimidation at the polls being another. I'm wondering what the rest of us think about that. I mean, I can't speak for voter intimidation factually, but I just, I feel like at the polls, I don't know if that's really that big of a concern. It could certainly be one this time if the president is wanting uh, people aligned with him to watch the polls or be outside of them. But I think historically, that's probably not been a problem since maybe the 60s. Um, Sorry, I go ahead, Ezra. Sorry, I would like to tack on to that um, voter intimidation. Um, I don't mean to attack anyone, but when you look like a minority and you live in a rural area like Orange County, going to the polls can be intimidating, especially when you're the only one who looks like you. Um, it 
feels like you're going to be attacked when the president says that you're a terrorist. So I will put that out there. It is a very real thing. Um, and some people might not experience it. That's that's a fair point. As a uh, white male, I would definitely not have that issue anywhere. I would just say, first of all, absolutely, that is a huge problem. And racism, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, these are gigantic issues in the United States, all of which I think need to be dealt with by us voting and getting people into power at our local level, in our school boards, uh, in our state legislature. And thank goodness that this year, you know, by uh, means of a horrible situation with COVID, that almost all of us could vote by mail. And um, that in spite of what President Trump has been saying, it's an enormously trustworthy system. For example, in uh, Oregon, uh, which has been doing this for quite a while, uh, is sent out over 100 million mail-in ballots since uh, the year 2000 and has do uh, documented only about a dozen cases of mail fraud, of proven fraud. That's a 0.000001% uh, chance of that of all votes cast that will be fraudulent. So let's all go if and I hate to say this Ezra, I, you know, it's wrong that you should feel intimidated, but you can certainly fit, send in a mail in ballot. Or, Thank you, Scott. Or, uh, uh, we have we have just a few seconds and then we have to respond to our very active audience members. Um, Christina, uh, so you'll go and then we'll start Q&A. Thank you. <clears throat> so I just want to say that I feel like discussions about voter fraud are certainly important to have, but I want to get back to the idea of voter suppression. So in addition to not just intimidation at the polls, we also have to consider the availability of said polls, specifically in African American communities. As of 2019, aka six years since the Supreme Court weakened aspects of the Voting Rights Act, 1,200 polling locations have disappeared from southern states. And unfortunately, our vote does not at all affect whether or not the Supreme Court justices get selected. That doesn't have anything to do with our vote directly. That is up to Congress as well as the president, and we don't really have a say over that fact. So that demonstrates how laws that absolutely affect our voting are not actually laws that we can vote for. So I think that's important to consider as well. Thank you, Christina, and thank you so much to our panelists. We are moving forward to our Q&A portion, and we do have lots of questions that we can respond to. Um, my job was to initially select some of these questions. However, I think that our panelists um, can uh, easier respond to these questions based on what they feel more informed to respond to. Uh, how, however, I think we can easily get started with the first uh, open Q&A that uh, directly uh, is towards to disagree strongly. Do you feel there is a form of intimidation to voters when elected officials express a need to have poll watchers? Um, disagree strongly, so that would be uh, Scott. Do you feel there is a form of intimidation to voters when elected officials well, express a need to have poll watchers? I think that uh, from my position, right, uh, you know, that's just simply protecting the integrity of the vote, right? So you could have those poll watchers from any part of the ideological, uh, either party um, and all of the uh, polls are also policed, right? There's always a law enforcement officer at these polls. So um, there's, no, uh, there's no way that just because someone's there to watch that that's uh, gonna stop anyone from voting. So now that doesn't mean that someone might perceive it that way, but I'm saying that I think that one of our big problems right now is that we're all watching a heck of a lot of cable television news and we need to stop because we're getting uh, really uh, made, we're, we're being uh, made very nervous by this. And a lot of anxiety is being provoked about this. And I think that the process itself is pretty darn dependable. And if we want to go and vote, we can vote. Um, and I understand that a lot of people have a lot of emotions that are flying because of this. Well, it's an emotional time. 
and we've got a major pandemic. The economy is in downward spiral. That's horrible. Um, the, the issues are gigantic. So the this election really, really matters. And it's, it's of course we're anxious, but our anxiety and the reality are two different things. Thank you so much. Uh, up next, we have. Polling is very safe in this country. To say it's unsafe is misleading and dishonest. Does anybody like would like to respond to that? Yeah, um, actually, I do have something to kind of add in there. Um, this is also a bit of an extension to the previous question as well, which is the entire poll watchers idea. Um, I think it's important to contextualize this in also some ground empirics, given that we appreciate some sources. NBC on August 20th of this year says that just based off of this last uh, year alone, the Trump campaign and the RNC had actually recruited 50,000 volunteers to act as poll watchers. The, the GOP's first national like poll patrol operation in 40 years. So the entire idea that they're just there to watch the polls and yet they are there uniquely to watch certain polls for one specific party, that right itself raises an issue. But it also goes back to something that Ezra had pointed out, which is this entire idea of the fact that it depends on it's not even perception because it's this entire idea that your structural position of who you occupy and what your skin color is will very much determine a series of, say, discriminatory gazes that you will certainly receive upon going to the polls. It's not a safe practice for some people of certain backgrounds to tend said polls, especially if there's an estimated 50,000 volunteers there to watch the polls. Why are they there to watch you and your vote? That's my larger question. And why is it always in specific areas where people of color and like live? I think that that within itself is incredibly suspicious. Thank, thank you for your response. Uh, up next, I think this is a little bit uh, of a, an open question for any of you that can respond. What does voting integrity mean to you? I guess it means that if, uh, I, if I want to vote, then I'm free to vote for whoever I want to, and that I can trust that once I cast my vote, it will be counted and uh, be part of a fair election. I would Thank also you. add in with, without, without persecution for doing so. Thank you. Up next, we have a question for Agree. Um, so Ezra, if you could respond to, since this voting system seems to be corrupt, how do we make a change? I think Dr. Spitzer put it very well. We change, we make, we make a change by going out and voting. Um, I believe Paulo Freire said the only way to change a corrupt system is to infiltrate it. Um, to learn how to speak their language and change it from the inside. And as much as it sucks, you do have to learn how to speak the language to infiltrate the system, to work it before you can dismantle it and make it work for you. Thank you so much. We will address a few more questions and then we will head to debrief. So up next, um, I'd like maybe undecided neutral to respond to this one. Why would anyone feel intimidated when it comes to voting? I think there are multiple reasons to feel intimidated that we've discussed in a variety of different ways, of course, starting with Ezra's experience, but also in discussions around voter suppression, three hour wait times in Georgia, polling places that don't even function or are being closed down, and then also matters of education, which we started off this conversation by discussing. Feeling uninformed absolutely is a problem. Those little pamphlets that we receive in the mail do not, the mail don't suffice whatsoever. Absolutely, it provides biased perspectives and it certainly doesn't allow voters to feel personally enfranchised, which is key to our democratic system. Thank Can you. Can I add something, Tara? Sure. Um, Christina, that was extremely well put. And I also want to touch on um, something Eric said when asked about um, uh, a question earlier about you know being able to vote with integrity free from persecution. And I think we've seen this all with the presidential debates lately and the complete inability the nation has been able to have about civil discourse and their opinions on voting. 
um, where it becomes a screaming match or a personal attack. Um, and sure, yes, it can be personal at times with voting, but at the same time, we need to preserve that integrity in um, allowing people to choose who they vote for. Thank you, Ashra. And uh, this last question is for Eric. Um, disagree somewhat. How can anyone feel like their vote matters when in the end the electoral college seems to get the final say? I mean, like Scott had said earlier, you're not just voting for the president, you're voting for the House of Representatives, you're voting for the Senate, you're voting for your local school board, your city council, your governor. There's so many down ballot votes that do not have the electoral college that sure, maybe you feel disenfranchised with your vote for the president, but there's so many votes that you do simultaneously that will count. Even in a state like California, if you're a Republican, it will count. Thank you to all panelists. And now that we uh, are at the end portion uh, of the Q&A portion, I'd like to head into uh, each panelist's closing speech. You will get one minute each to reiterate um, how you're feeling now that uh, you've participated in this civil dialogue and you've heard from various viewpoints as well as questions and comments in Q&A. By the way, the panelists are able to see all of your comments and questions in Q&A. So since we started with Carlos uh, for the introduction speech, um, Scott, would you be able to start the closing speech? You have one minute. Well, first of all, I'm so impressed with uh, everybody here. A anytime I'm in a debate where someone drops Pablo Freire, who's one of my favorite writers, I'm delighted to be part of this. Um, I uh, one, one thing I learned here uh, is I heard a lot of people talking about intimidation, about unevenness in uh, access to the polls, um, about uh, the harsh uh, impact of racism, Islamophobia, all those kinds of things on, uh, on the vote. And I really understand that and I, uh, and I but like I wanna go back to this, uh, is this question, which is that is, is our vote, uh, can, can we trust the voting system? And I think that's the key thing here, folks. We can trust it. And that's what makes America so, uh, still so great a place to be which is that we know that if we go out there and use our vote, that that will count, that will count. And it'll count at the local level all the way up to the national level. And don't take my word for it, take the word for um, a lot of different groups that have used it to make major changes over our history. Um, it wasn't a long time ago uh, when Donald Trump got elected president. Believe me, those people who really love Donald Trump and everything that he stands for, were excited to actually shake up the Republican Party and move our the direction of our country in a radically different direction than the last eight years previous to that of President Obama. And that all happened by using their vote. Tons of people Thank voted who never voted before. And so we can do the same thing right now. And the election is coming up. Don't stay home. Thank or you. Don't stay home. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Up next, we have Eric for Disagree Somewhat. All right. So I still think that I, I agree the voting election system is safe, and but it definitely can be improved if there are people that are minorities vote by mail. And if you can't vote by mail now, you know, go and vote this time and try to make a change in your state so that they will allow access for voting by mail for people that feel intimidated. And, um, you know, I hope that eventually we can change our legislative branches to have proportional representation so that all these minority views in the United States have a voice that they currently don't have at all now. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Christina for Undecided Neutral. Hi, I want to start by saying thank you for everyone for attending, as well as thank you to my fellow panelists for this lively but polite discussion. 
I think it's really important that we don't see the system as broken beyond repair, but rather that we see this as an opportunity to fix it, starting with discussions like this. What can be done to fix the Electoral College, which we seem to all agree somewhat is an issue in how it currently exists? How can we empower voters through education, at the polls, and in their communities? And how can we truly make our democratic system accessible for all? I think these are the questions that we must continue to consider if we ever hope to instill a sense of faith and trust in the American voting system. Thank you, Christina. Uh, up next, we have Ezra for Agree Somewhat. Thank you, Tara. And I wanna thank all of my wonderful panelists and everyone in the audience and everyone who really asked great questions uh, for this lively um, conversation. Um, I want to go back to how we discussed a lot of different um, systems of inequality in this conversation and how a lot of them don't necessarily have to do with voting, but they do affect it pretty significantly. Um, so in order to change these systems of inequality, we need to go out there and vote to make sure that we can make a change and have the representation that we need. So that way, if you're a minority, your, um, your option to vote isn't just mail-in voting, so that you have that right to go in and vote. Thank you, Ezra. And last but not least, we have Carlos for Agree Strongly. Hi, thank you all. And I really appreciate the engaging discussion that we all had and the ability to be cordial as well. And honestly, shout out as well to all the students that we have that are watching this. It's really great to see you all just tuned in. I think that I'm just going to end this by saying that the entire topic of trust is not really getting to this entire idea of trust as reciprocal. Yeah, we can endorse the system, but the real question is, does the system endorse us? And I'm still on the side that believes that it does not. Voting thus far has been literally a performance of our own equality, especially when we are literally asking people to go down to the polls. And despite the fact that, sure, accessibility, absolutely. But if we don't solve for inequality, then it's not really doing anything more than repeating history. But still, honestly, I'm encouraged. Nihilistic and sounding. <laughs> I'm still really encouraged because seeing the courage of protesters from the entire summer has shown me that your vote is not the only expression of your voice, but your voice does matter. And there will be attempts to satisfy us with symbolic victories of equity and real justice. But I would encourage us to not really tune into those efforts. Go out and vote, but don't make it the end all, be all solution. Thank you so much to all panelists. Uh, up next, Lee Thatch is going to give us a summary of all the arguments that were made in this event. Lee, um, it's yeah. your turn. All right, I'm good to go. So I will describe starting with the strongly agree and work my way to um, the strongly disagree side. So this is for everyone who wants a general summary of what was happening in this discussion. Um, to start with strongly agree, uh, Carlos says that uh, Black Lives Matters uh, the protests were an example of not only direct action as a uh, maybe preferable form, of political engagement, but it also shows the lack of representation in our elected officials. For example, that both President Trump and candidate Joe Biden are both for funding the police and that we do not have national representatives who represent the concerns of the voter. And this may be due to the Princeton study that I referenced earlier, in which the reason why we have such a narrow overton window about which policies uh, politicians will vote for is because the wealthy class have more influence uh, over policy than everyday uh, middle class or low income voters. Um, however, so that means that even if we do vote, the political parties remain the same, that both parties represent the ruling class. Uh, even if our votes are counted, there are larger structural problems that prevent voice, voters from voicing, uh, from their voices of, to be heard. And so hence why direct action may be a preferable alternative to being able to change the system, that no matter who wins this next election, we still need direct action as a form of mobilizing uh, communities to effectuate social change. Um, and as for, and however, there's still a problem when it comes to voting of intimidation of minority voters to vote, which uh, the other panelists have uh, addressed that I will also summarize too. And so um, I like Carlos's description of does the system endorse us? And if the system does not endorse us, then we might have to refer to alternative forms of political organization. Um, Ezra on the agree side uh, makes the argument that 
um, that the voting system can be trusted by those in positions of power, such as wealthy voters having easier access to vote. For example, in Louisville, uh, due to the closing of polling stations, a county with 600,000 people only has one polling station on top of other problems such as voter ID laws. So the reason as to why low income voters don't vote is because the cost of voting is higher for them, that they have to take a day off or they have children uh, in childcare. Whereas, and also the other issue with uh, the other structural barrier or problem with voting is the electoral college, which has been discussed. That maybe excuse the one that the uh, president that wins the popular vote doesn't always win the election, such as the 2000 and 2016 election. Uh, but it, uh, I will also add maybe excuse the issues so that only swing states have influence over what it what is being talked about. For example, in the vice presidential debate, uh, both Democrats and Republicans support fracking uh, in order to appeal to Midwestern independent voters in swing states. Uh, but also on top of that, the electoral college may uh, make it unfair for uh, voters in larger states. So if you're a liberal in Texas or if you're a conservative in California, uh, you might have might have more voter apathy because you feel your vote uh, doesn't count. So uh, however, the what distinguishes Ezra's position from uh, Carlos's position is that despite these problems, uh, the reason as to why uh, why they represent somewhat disagree is that even if there are problems in our voting system, we should still have a diversity of tactics uh, that includes direct action and uh, and voting as well. That we have to infiltrate uh, the system, as uh, Ezra summarizes and paraphrases uh, Paulo Freire, uh, who is a, a Brazilian educator. So, uh, if you want to read his book, The Pedagogy of the Repressed, I would suggest that book. Uh, almost every educator reads uh, that book. Um, for the neutral position, uh, Christina. Uh, makes uh, points out that uh, we should we should both trust the voting system to a certain extent, uh, but also be critical of it as well. Uh, the problem with not trusting this voting system is that it creates more uh, apathy in which, and when we do not vote, there is no other alternative to be able to pressure representatives to um, advocating for policies that we want. For example, Christina brings up the three hour waiting lines in uh, the state of Georgia, uh, that at the least voting can be a form of harm reduction uh, and that even then, uh, and that to reduce any harms that politicians at, or the other side may create, um, but also we, we should make a distinction between both political parties, that there is a difference between Biden versus Trump, uh, even with, no matter how marginal those differences might be. Uh, Christina also brought up still structural barriers to voting, such as the Supreme Court vo voting down the, or uh, stripping the powers of the Voting Rights Act that we need to be able to be aware of. However, we, even if there is a problem with voting that we still need to participate, we can also critique the process of voting if we want to improve the system. Uh, if we want to change structural barriers to voting, then we need to vote for representatives who hear our concerns and who have the power to change electoral processes so that it's accessible to everyone. And so if politicians are the ones preventing voters from voting, then we need, to, we need our own politicians who advocate for better access to everyone. Uh, on the disagree side, uh, Eric first mentions the fact that uh, what we are talking about is whether or not our votes will, will be counted. And the fact is that there is very, very minimal voter fraud happening and that mail-in ballots are an effective way for all votes to be counted. Um, for example, um, we can vote for representatives to fix the electoral college uh, and, and then maybe have a popular vote for the president so that it is one head, one, one, head, one vote. And so either, either way, voting is the only means or one of the only means by which we could change uh, these structural barriers. Um, and, and as far as overcoming voter intimidation, which was also a point that Carlos brought up, uh, er, uh, Eric brought up the point that mail-in ballots are a good a corrective to that because it means that we don't have to physically show up to the polls. And given that um, most people agree that mail-in ballots can be effective, then that could be one way in which we address um, a voter intimidation, as well as other uh, policies that we could pass to protect uh, voters as well. Um, I will also mention that uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, the uh, issue that we will have to contend with is making sure that every voter knows how to do mail-in ballots so that their votes are actually counted. And so that might require more civic education. For example, in Pennsylvania, if you turn in a naked ballot, which you don't put in a uh, ballot in a certain envelope, then your vote might not be counted, which was a Supreme Court case uh, that was made, or was Pennsylvania Supreme Court case that was made earlier. Uh, and then lastly, for strongly disagree, uh, Dr. Spitzer, uh, makes the argument that everything that we've discussed so far is not a problem with the voting system, but rather broader problems that we can solve by voting in representatives who can hear our concerns and reform the voting system, such as the Electoral College or voter ID laws. Uh, and because it is ultimately dangerous to delegitimize the voting system because it delegitimizes the candidates and the government, uh, which ultimately prevents the purpose of democracy, which is a peaceful transition of power. Uh, which was, yeah, so when, for example, uh, President Trump insinuates that he will not cede the election to the Democrats because he sees uh, the voting
voting system as rigged against him, uh, that throws in the uh, throws into question the entire legitimacy of our government and prevents us from being able to have politicians or candidates being able to pass certain policies and have voter trust. Um, so uh, Dr. Spitzer also mentioned the fact that participation has increased over the years, especially among young voters. And it is this uh, increase in participation that is going to be able to effectuate social change. Um, as far as the question about the Electoral College, Dr. Spitzer also mentions that the reason as to why we need Electoral College now is because st uh, voters in states with smaller populations, such as rural voters, uh, need more representation so that they are not always outvoted by voters in more populous states or in urban uh, cities. Uh, as far as intimidation, uh, we can, even if there is intimidation, uh, we can at least always trust that when you vote, if all our votes uh, count. But even when there are structural barriers, all, all every vote will count. So if we are able to overcome those structural barriers individually, then that can lead to uh, policy changes with voting, but also ones that we are advocating for. And Spitzer, uh, Dr. Spitzer also notice, uh, makes the point that um, all, politics is, uh, all politics is local. Um, that if you are a supporter of Black Lives Matters, then who you vote for chief of police or who you vote for a district attorney um, matters. And that it is those local elections or even voting for, for propositions that do really uh, cause change in our local uh, government and local community. Um, and lastly, as for the election, uh, to address the election of Donald Trump, uh, Dr. Spitzer makes the uh, uh, points out that Donald Trump ran an unconventional campaign, that he was an outsider who infiltrated the Republican Party. Uh, and on the Democratic side, we have something similar in terms of the electing the first Black president and President Barack Obama. And so even if our voting is a limited form of action, it can still create very uh, radical or massive change uh, in our system from either side of the political aisle. All right, and, and that's it. <laughs> Wasn't that uh, a great comprehensive summary? Um, all right, thank you so much, Lee, for that amazing summary. And to conclude this event, I'd like to thank our panelists um, and my co-organizers, Lorenzo, Brianna, Amanda, and Scott, as well as Cal State Fullerton, of course, for always encouraging civil dialogue on campus. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today. The importance of civility shouldn't end with this dialogue. I hope you have demonstrated that differing viewpoints can be productively communicated. I encourage you to apply the principles of civil dialogue in your daily life. And remember, there will always be differences. It's how we as humans approach them that fosters peace and understanding in our community. And as Tuffy, our CSUF mascot would say, um, use your voice and go vote. Uh, voting information is on our slide and it is uh, Cal State Ful it's Fulton edu forward slash election. We will also have a video of this event up on that website next week. If you Google CSUF election, you should see that website. Um, thank you so much again for everybody for attending and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>